This programming is sponsored by Central Markets Cheese Department, featuring more than 500 types of cheese from around the world, and Cheesemongers to offer cheese and charcuterie pairing tips. More at centralmarket.com. This programming is sponsored by Linscom Wealth, a wealth management firm partnering with individuals and families dedicated to helping them build, preserve, and manage wealth by creating a customized plan to work toward achieving their goals. More at linscomwealth.com. This is Houston Matters. I'm Craig Cohen. Good morning. Coming up this hour, comparing prices and quality at Houston area hospitals. The latest in consumer tech. The Cougs' big overtime win over the Aggies and a developing scandal involving baseball's biggest superstar and what it says about the pervasiveness of gambling in pro sports. But first, the Texas Medical Board on Friday published what it sees as guidance for doctors about how to define what constitutes a medical exception under the state's strict abortion ban. In a few minutes, we'll discuss some of the questions raised by it. We start, though, with Dr. Sharif Zafran, president of the Texas Medical Board, who discussed the board's guidance on Saturday with Houston Matters producer Celeste Sherman. The proposal is considered a guideline. Why did the board decide to go with general guidance versus more specific list of exemptions? A list of exemptions is, number one, uh, never going to be exhaustive. And number two, uh, it's always going uh, to have to take consideration of the circumstance of the case itself. And that's why we use a very specific language of medical judgment because medical judgment is going to be dependent on the circumstance of the case, the location of the case, what other considerations had to be taken while that case was going on. For example, one of the things that we listed in the rule proposal is the ability, for example, to transfer to a higher level of care. So there may be one given circumstance uh, or one given condition that may have a different uh, answer in one circumstance where you're in an urban area versus in a rural area uh, where there may not be the ability to uh, render care in a way that you may be able to in an, in an urban area. When we were looking at rules and lists around elective surgery during COVID and we tried to provide guidelines around that time and it was never going to be able to be an exhaustive list even in spite of putting a lot of specifics out there a lot of surgeons would ask us, well, what about this type of case? What if it was cancer here? Or what if it was cancer that could not wait more than a month or something along those lines? And what we really said at the end of the day is you just have to document to us if you, in your judgment, believe that a case is emergent and describe the scenario and the situation why. And that is really what we're going to go by. We cannot go into a list of exhaustive types of surgeries that are emergent versus those that are elective. And this is very similar to that type of circumstance where, you know, you've got to just describe to us why you believe that a woman's life is in danger and that an abortion must be done to preserve the woman's life or organ function. And we listed in the, in the rule how to document in the medical record the scenario that would describe that something is going to harm a woman's life or harm bodily function in those types of scenarios. Right. And Dr. Zephyr, speaking of medical judgment, when you all were making this proposal and these guidelines, does the Texas Medical Board believe moving forward, this proposal really provides true guidance for doctors to better serve women? Again, as far as physicians and patients alike saying that these rules don't clarify much and uh, that they may be exempt from the ban and so forth and that it gives no reassurance, I just wanted to say, as we've made clear from the start, the Medical Board cannot change the laws that are in effect today. What we can do is assure physicians that within the board's enforcement process, abortion is not going to be treated any differently. That's what these rules seek to do, to give physicians more guidance for what should be documented to justify the treatment in any given care case. You know, the issue is something that is not really in our control. We can control how the Texas Medical Board will look at a case and how a an order by the Texas Medical Board against a physician would look would be would be rendered. We have no control over civil action or criminal action that would be brought about by an outside agency. And that's actually the case uh, even today. I mean, if somebody wants to prosecute a uh, physician for uh, inappropriate use of opioids, 
that would be completely different than anything that we would do. I mean, again, it is part of the Medical Practice Act, but we have no control over, over how that would be done. Now, in most instances, a lot of outside agencies would defer to the medical board when it comes to instances like that. But again, we have no control over that. And we've also stated that if there's already some kind of action going on against a physician from outside of the medical board, the medical board reserves the ability to defer going through a process of looking at a case if another agency is already looking at it from beforehand. Right. Dr. Zephyrin, based on the guidelines the board provided, what would a doctor do when confronted with a potential exemption to ensure that they are following the law? If a physician in their judgment believed that a scenario arose that a woman's life is in danger or that there is major bodily function that can be affected or impacted in a permanent way, then they would just need to document that. They would need to document what the scenario is Mm -hmm. and why they believe so. Again, just like they would with any other case from the standpoint of standard of care. And as is stated, you know, when we go through these processes, we send these cases out to expert panelists. And these expert panelists are physicians out in the community who are licensed in Texas, who are peers of physicians in that same specialty. And what we look at and what we ask is, what would a physician in a similar situation have done? What would the community standard be in that type of situation? Would another physician in that specialty under that circumstance also have agreed that permanent bodily function from the standpoint of harm would have been done or that a woman's life has been in danger. What are the next steps with the proposed guidance and is there potential for the proposal to change? So the uh, proposed rule, I, I want to be careful actually to use rule instead of guideline, is, uh, is out for public comment. Uh, public comment has to be a minimum of 30 days. The board will be meeting again in June. That doesn't mean that we have to wait until June, but in order to do it before June, there would have to be an emergency board meeting that would be announced and posted and held. But we would look at all the uh, proposed comments up until June. We are probably going to also have a stakeholder meeting to bring in additional input. We will look at all these comments and uh, actually even respond to all those comments. If we believe that there is a comment there that would further enhance our proposed rule, within the boundaries of the existing law, in other words, what would allow us to be able to add into rule without going beyond existing statute or existing other statutes, then we we could potentially add that in there or modify what we have in there. Now, if we made changes or additions that are significant, then uh, we would propose that amended uh, rule in June and uh, potentially send it out for additional comment. Uh, So it could potentially go out into the August meeting. Once we get something that we all agree, uh, when I say all all of us as uh, board members uh, agree is something that we can move forward on, uh, it would be debated and it would be voted on by the board. And once it's voted on, it would become an actual rule at that point. Dr. Sharif Zafrin, president of the Texas Medical Board, talking with Houston Matters' Celeste Sherman. Joining us now is University of Houston law professor Seth Chandler. Seth, welcome back to the program. Good morning. Morning. Does this proposed language really offer clarity to the Texas medical community? Very little. It does a little bit in clarifying what bodily functions might need to be affected in order to gain the emergency exception. It provides a recipe to follow for documenting it. But in terms of both the fundamental confusion about the regulations and the restrictions in abortion in Texas law, it does not do much. Let me ask you to scoot up a little bit towards that microphone. Is it reasonable to assume doctors could have a a clear understanding uh, of what they are and are not supposed to do? No, and I don't really accept the TMB's explanation that because they can't write a perfect uh, regulation that covers every possible case, they can't do better than they have. Many regulatory agencies at the federal level and at the state level when dealing with complex matters like this, use what they call regulation by example, where they basically say, they list 10 examples and they say, okay, these five are permitted by the regulation and these five are not. And yes, it doesn't exhaust the field, but it makes concrete to people what is permissible and what is not. And I would hope that in the amendment process that's going on or the proposal process, that some of that idea gets incorporated. 
Does what the board is proposing as a rule uh, relieve or protect a doctor from being held liable for terminating a pregnancy if they, they follow that rule as best they can? Not technically, but th that I don't fault the TM before. They can't uh, uh, tell you how the criminal courts or civil courts are supposed to operate. I would say, though, that a doctor who has been found cleared by the TMB, their lawyer is surely going to waive that document and the TMB regulations in front of a court. And I suspect it might prove quite influential either to a court if it went to a trial or a prosecutor contemplating bringing charges. Uh, under the board's proposed rule, as we heard, doctors would need to thoroughly document their reasoning for why they've decided to terminate a pregnancy. Uh, do you feel it's clear what would constitute proper documentation here? I actually think the documentation part of the regulation is one of the better parts of it in that it tells doctors in Texas how the TMB thinks about it. What really is the emergency? Are there alternatives to an abortion that you could provide both within your facility and outside it? And I think it tells the doctors to put on paper what they were likely thinking about anyway, since they know that performing an abortion in Texas is risky. So I think it's actually a good idea to have them put it on paper. Aside from citing, here are examples where this should be uh, permitted and here are examples where it should not. Is there anything else that you would like to see the Texas Medical Board say or spell out differently in, in this process? It's a hard problem because the fundamental issue is not what the TMB is doing. It's what the Texas legislature has done. No rape exception, for example. Well, the TMB can't include that. Uh, it doesn't make the subjective good faith of the doctor dispositive. Instead, it calls for reasonable medical judgment, meaning the doctor can be second-guessed. TMB can't do anything about that. That's the legislature's decision. And so I think the TMB has made a small step in clarifying matters, as the Texas Supreme Court asked it to do. But I don't think they've gone as far as they can. And therefore, I don't think if the proposed regulations take effect, we're going to see much of a change. We went from 50,000 abortions. Uh, surgical abortions per year in Texas before the new law is down to 50 last year. I don't expect that these new regulations are going to bump that 50 up in a very large way. This proposed new rule comes ahead of the U.S. Supreme Court taking up an abortion-related case and hearing arguments tomorrow over whether the FDA overlooked safety problems when it made mifepristone, one of the, the two most common pills used in the most common uh, type of abortion, easier to obtain, including from mail-order pharmacies. There are ways Texans can receive this pill through the mail without breaking the law, uh, and no doubt a number do. How significant could it be uh, here if the high court were to change how or if women get access to this particular pill? Right. This is the big case as a practical matter because of the predominance of medication abortions these days. And so if the Supreme Court were to move the a time period back when it was permissibly used from seven, 10 weeks to seven weeks as it was uh, in prior years or to require you to actually go to a doctor to get the prescription as a practical matter, that would, uh, I think, substantially reduce access to medication abortions in Texas or at least lawful medication abortions here in Texas. Seth Chandler is a professor of law at the University of Houston Law Center. Seth, thank you so much. My pleasure. Up next, we stick with health care and talk about a report out this month that compares the cost of Houston area hospitals and the quality of care they provide. Stay with us as Houston Matters continues. This is Houston Matters. I'm Craig Cohen. Quality costs. We pay more for comfort, reliability, durability, safety. Oh, if only I were talking about cars. No, I'm talking about health care. There's an underlying assumption in any industry that the more you spend on something, the higher quality it must be. But isn't that, uh, in fact, true when it comes to Houston area hospitals? A report out this month from Rice University's Baker Institute for Public Policy suggests not necessarily. Here to explain is one of its co-authors, Rice University and Baylor College of Medicine health economist Vivian Ho. Vivian, good morning. Morning, Craig. Your report is called Beyond the Bill, Comparing Price and Quality at Houston Area Hospitals. What, what exactly are you trying to demonstrate with this brief? 
Well, the federal government is encouraging hospitals and insurers, well, actually requiring them to make their pricing data available. So um, everybody is worried about their rising health care insurance premiums. And one of the things we can do to sort of slow down that growth is to analyze these prices and figure out, are we getting a good deal, whether it's with a particular insurer or, you know, with the, with the price that the hospital negotiates with an insurer? And so this is about making this data available to the public and to employers in the Houston area. And you compare these different health insurance companies' prices through various hospital groups. Uh, as you said, federal law requires that this stuff be reported does that mean you actually got all the pricing information that you were seeking? No, we didn't. <laughs> we were so so we were very fortunate. We partnered with Mathematica that's got a great um great access to computing and resources. These these data sets are are multiple terabytes in size and the insurers are dumping them out on a, on a regular basis. They're required to put them out sent quarterly or monthly. So we started with just two insurers. We started with Blue Cross Blue Shield Texas and with Aetna and Mathematica is working to download more information from the other major insurers that, that, that insure Houston employers. But uh, the data is incredibly incomplete. Um, you know, we were only able to match up, for example, Blue Cross Blue Shield, Texas, we could get prices for, I think, you know, maybe sort of 20 something different inpatient diagnoses, maybe 30 something outpatient treatments. And uh, how dramatic a difference is there in price? Can, can you point to an example of a procedure that uh, under Blue Cross Blue Shield of Texas costs a lot more than it does under Aetna or in one hospital group versus another hospital group? So we weren't able to compare a particular procedure across insurance companies because it, the insurers turned out that they, they sort of reported on different types of procedures. But if you sort of look within, I can't remember the exact numbers, but colonoscopy, it's in the report that, that you know, it can vary by over a thousand dollars. And just in general, the price is vary by twofold um, for either insurer across hospitals in Texas, in Houston. And uh, again, uh, I'm sure from the perspective of, of most people, they think, well, okay, there's a certain amount of logic to this, that there are some hospitals that we're just convinced are, are better quality hospitals. And so a procedure should cost more there than somewhere else. Yeah, right. And so in some cases, you will see that in the data that we were able to look at. So, for example, if you look at inpatient procedures and hospital star ratings, which are published by the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services based on a wide range of quality measures, you will see Houston Methodist has a five-star hospital rating, and it is the highest priced. But that's not always the case. You'll actually look at, you know, outpatient procedures and and um, and. And other cases where you see, for example, there are cases where um, HCA's um, Texas Medical Center Hospital has five-star ratings, but it's substantially lower priced than many of their hospitals that have lower quality ratings. So, so there are many cases where you can get very high quality care at a lower price. Are you suggesting Houstonians, when faced with a choice about what hospital to go to for certain procedures, should, in fact, shop around? Um, I, I definitely think that they should. I know it's really hard to do that at this point. We're working on making the data more complete and more simple so that so so we caution people who say, look, this is this is this is the direction we're headed. You can have a look at these and they will give you a general idea, I think, of which hospitals are higher priced and which are lower priced. And by the way, you can end up, for example, paying a higher price if you go to the Texas Medical Center version of one of the major consolidated healthcare systems versus say going to Clear Lake. It might be cheaper to go to the suburban facility. Not always the case, but keep that in mind. Do you think that that is maybe a bit surprising for some folks? That, that maybe they assume, oh, uh, if it's out in the burbs and the, the, the property values are higher surrounding that hospital, that must be better care in terms of quality uh, and higher cost. But 
maybe not? Yeah, I, I, I see what you're saying, Craig. And it, and it certainly you go to the, the, the newer facilities out in the suburbs, they look very nice and, and that they might be higher priced, but maybe not because the Texas Medical Center facility is, is pushing for a higher price for higher quality care. And it, it depends also on the condition. For example, if you're having a heart attack, you probably want to pay for that five-star hospital in the Texas Medical Center. But if, if, if it's something that is more common, um, certainly, gosh, a mammogram or, uh, or something like that, then, then, you know, you do want to look more closely at price and not so much at quality. All, all, of these, all of these quality ratings, you know, when they say five-star versus three-star, three-star is still very good in CMS's view. It's, you know, it's sort of when you're getting to one star, that that's a hospital you want to avoid. But, but, but still for many of these things, you know, they're doing this rating for all these complicated types of things, um, the heart attacks, the septicemia, but, but, you know, there are things that are much more common that everyone can do well. I'm thinking hip replacement, you know, that's a case where it's like, I don't necessarily need to go to the five-star hospital to get a hip or knee replacement done well. I, I go to the grocery store each week. There are certain things I do not skimp on. Other things I will look for the best bargain. That's groceries. Hospital procedures can be life or death. It's a decision sometimes you're making in a matter of seconds. If the most expensive hospital in the Houston area for a given procedure offers even only slightly better care, couldn't that be worth it? It could be. It really depends on on how rare the condition is i have to remind you when we talk about the the, the top places they're all outstanding you know it, and 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 they're, they're 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 rated best in the country in those cases they all do a very good job if you've got a rare condition though where there's not much experience you want the best specialist then then you want to go to the five star place is it enough to compare a certain procedure across hospitals and hospital systems in the area, or should you also take into account any related procedures or needs? Who also offers the best rehabilitation services or post-surgery in-home follow-up, or who responds best or has the fewest incidences of post-surgery complications? I mean, aren't there other factors to weigh in here? Yeah, there's a lot of additional um, factors, some that depend on the healthcare system and some that actually depend on the quality of the insurer and the insurer able to provide you that seamless experience. And all this is, I mean, I think you're going to be talking about AI later. Think what we can do when we're able to digest all of this, this information and put it into an AI system to be able to tell which is the best place to go based on the price, the quality, and the subsequent outcomes. What barriers at the moment prevent many Houstonians from receiving quality care without spending too much money? Well, we have no information in terms of the prices. So that's that's the major what that's one of the major barriers we're trying to overcome by making this information available to the public. There's lots of different teams scrambling to get this price data and for example, you know, sell it to employers or publish papers and and so when I spoke with Mathematica, I said, let's take a different approach. Let's try and get this information out to the public and let them push and 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 see and and learn how does the healthcare system work? What are these prices doing to 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 my bills? And and really just just um, trying to encourage people to say there will be a better way to shop for health insurance and a health and and the right healthcare system to give you high quality care at lowest cost. Um, and and let's just help the consumer do that. The report is called Beyond the Bill: Comparing Price and Quality at Houston Area Hospitals. We'll post a link to it at HoustonMatters.org. Vivian Ho is a health economist at Rice University and Baylor College of Medicine, and co-authored the report with Evelyn Lee. Vivian, thank you very much. Thank you, Craig. Just ahead, why the DOJ is suing Apple and what Comcast's fiber expansion in the Houston area means for its customers. We discuss those and other developments in consumer technology with Houston Chronicle Tech columnist Dwight Silverman as Houston Matters continues.
This is Houston Matters. I'm Craig Cohen. On the fourth Monday of each month, we are joined by Houston Chronicle tech columnist Dwight Silverman to talk over developments in the world of consumer tech. Hello, Dwight. Good morning, Craig. Uh, let's start with Apple. We learned last week Apple's being sued by the Department of Justice. Why? Well, um, it's an antitrust suit. And uh, one of the interesting things about it is it's been a long time coming. Uh, the D Department of Justice has been working on this for months and probably years. Um, and essentially, it looks at Apple's lock-in on its ecosystem. Um, it accuses it of uh, leveraging its monopoly power to shut out other players. Um, but the problem with the lawsuit is it makes a lot of dubious uh, statements about what is a monopoly, and a lot of the details in it are kind of out of date. Apple has already dealt with uh, with some of the issues that they allege. Yeah, I, I mean, my impression is that there are Apple people and there are Android people. <laughs> And it seems like there's a, a healthy competition between the two. Well, one of the weird things that the Justice Department um, did in trying to define a monopoly, um, you know, Apple has about a 50 to 60 percent market share in the U.S. Um, and that's all that they're dealing with. They're not dealing with globally. Globally, Android is the number one smartphone maker or smartphone platform. <clears throat> and in, um, in this case, in order to kind of make it look more sinister, the, uh, first of all, they talk about revenue as a function of monopoly, which has historically not been what it is. It's been market share. And then it also talks about, which is weird, if you combine Apple and Samsung together, it's a 90% market share. Well, wait a minute. You're throwing another manufacturer in who's a competitor to come up with 90% to say this is a monopoly? You know, there's some there's some weird uh, legal gymnastics. There. There's a really good uh, essay uh, by Jason Snell at the Apple blog, Six Colors. Uh, he was the editor of Macworld for years and years. He knows what he's talking about. And it's a really good assessment of this. It's worth reading. You wrote a recent column on Apple and AI. What AI-related advances are in the updated MacBook Air? Oh, that's real. So that's really interesting. So what's funny is that is actually innovation by press release, because <laughs> because Apple has always had what's called a neural engine, at least since the iPhone 10, in the processors for the iPhone and the iPad, and now the Mac, because they're using the same design of processors. Um, so when Apple released the first version of this redesigned MacBook Air, including the 15-inch MacBook Air, which is a beautiful machine, um, it has a neural engine, just like everything else does. This is a part of the processor specifically designed to deal with machine learning and speed up AI functions. Uh, and so it's also in the new chip that was announced in this newest version of the MacBook Air. And suddenly it is the best AI machine, uh, uh, consumer AI machine. It didn't mention that in the press release for last year's MacBook Air, but the design is very similar. It's a better neural engine. But Apple suddenly is on the AI train, and one of the reasons is is that coming this June, when Apple does its Worldwide Developers Conference, they're going to re-architect the uh, software for iPhones uh, so that it will uh, leverage AI. They, they have been in talks with Google, as they've also talked to OpenAI about using their AI models uh, in this, and it's supposed to be a, quite a transformative version of iOS 18. Uh, can you give some examples of how AI is or maybe integrated into whatever work we all are doing on our desktops or laptops? What are ways that it, in theory, should make things easier? Um, the, the, that's a very interesting question. So um, let's let's talk a little bit about some of the rumors in iOS 18, and that'll give you a good example of how it could work. Okay. So one of the things right now is if you go to make a playlist – in uh, Apple Music, uh, you kind of have to laboriously put it together. You can ask it to do a genius playlist based on X, but you can't say to it, you know, I want a playlist of all the songs that I really like by this particular artist. 
that supposedly is what's going to happen in iOS 18. I would be able to go, for example, this weekend, uh, I helped another uh, writer put together a playlist for songs referencing Superman. I had to go, first of all, there is a buttload of songs <laughs> referencing a lot of them. Superman. Yeah. And so I had to go through this huge list and put, help this guy put together a playlist. Um, if I had had AI in Apple Music, I would be able to say, give me the most popular songs referencing Superman or have Superman in the title as a playlist. Give me 30 of them. And it would be done instantly. Hmm. That's the kind of thing it will have. Right now, uh, Microsoft has its uh, product called Copilot, which is a rebranded version of OpenAI's uh, ChatGPT. And uh, it is built in already to Office, and it's built into Windows. You can ask it to search for you. You can ask it to, to draft memos and, and so forth. One of the things that I did with ChatGPT recently was I was uh, putting together a schedule of volunteers at the condo community where I live. We were rewiring it for fiber optic service. And um, and I had a list of what everybody's schedule was and when they were available. And I asked it to put together a calendar with their availability. And it did it in 10 seconds. That's the kind of thing where it makes, makes that life easier for you. This is Houston Matters. I'm Craig Cohen. We're discussing developments in consumer technology with Houston Chronicle tech columnist Dwight Silverman. Just last week, you wrote about Comcast's fiber expansion in the Houston area. What does it mean for Comcast's customers? So what's really interesting about this is that whenever you think about Comcast, you think, oh, the cable company, right? Because right. for decades, they were cable TV, and then they were internet. Um, but fiber optic uh, is uh, cheaper to maintain. It's faster. You can have the same upload speeds as download speeds, which you can't do with the current standard for cable. And so as they are expanding into new areas, which they announced last week with $156 million expansion, they, instead of building out cable, they are building out fiber service. So in a new neighborhood or in rural areas that don't have it yet, they're putting in fiber, which means it's the same technology that you get from AT&T's fiber internet service. You know, I think you can, you can basically say that in this case, fiber one and um, but what's coming, what's interesting about this is that you do have the same upload speeds as download speeds. Everybody who's got uh, Comcast Xfinity service know you get you may have gigabit downloads, but you have 20 megabit uploads. Right. Right. And so now you will be able to have gigabit uploads and downloads. And there's a new version of the cable modem standard called DOCSIS 4 that's coming later this year. It will also bring symmetrical speeds to cable. So, so the legacy version of Comcast will catch up to the fiber version. Will that work if you have an old router modem? Or would you need to buy something new to, to make that of happen? Of course not, Craig. You will have to buy something <laughs> new. You know better than that. Yeah. What What is the difference in cost between uh, the these fiber connections with these more vibrant upload and download speeds that match one another versus what, what we've gotten through the, the legacy cable? It's, it's a little early to say because... Um, you know, to a certain extent, these are brand new for Comcast. Um, they did not get into what the prices are in these areas because, first of all, they haven't laid them yet. <clears throat> they do offer currently a fiber service right now in in if you are in a regular service area, but they have to bring fiber to your house. The installation is expensive, um, and I think it costs like $200 a month. So it's not cheap, but when it is the standard... <clears throat> the prices will probably be equal to what you get with DOCSIS 4. How much <laughs> upload and download speed do we really need? Ah, that that is probably the <clears throat> $200 a month question. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, it depends. <clears throat> so if you are a, if you have a big family, uh, you're wealthy, you're affluent, you've got a 4K TV in every kid's room and everybody's got an Xbox and you're working from home and doing telecommuting and everybody's watching movies and download and playing online games, you probably need that kind of speed. If you are like uh, me and my wife, you know, we're empty nesters, we've got one television set, we both do some, some telecommuting in our jobs, we probably don't need it 
But you know what? It's nice to have. And Comcast and other cable uh, internet providers are pricing these things competitively so you can have it and it's not that much more than, say, 800 megabits or 500 megabits. I'll let you grab a drink of water here while I yes. talk a little bit about an article that was in Forbes earlier this month from futurist Bernard Marr uh, about what he sees as the biggest consumer tech trends coming over the next 10 years. He suggested these big leaps forward to watch for. Smartphone screens replaced by graphic overlays. The phones themselves becoming AI assistants. Brain computer interfaces making things like remote controls obsolete. Personal robotic assistants becoming commonplace. And virtual reality enhanced by AI getting us closer to the Star Trek holodeck experience. What do you make of those predictions? Uh, I think they're probably 20 years out as opposed to 10 if they happen at all. I don't know about you, but I don't want to control my TV with a chip implanted in my brain. I wouldn't. I might not necessarily mind wearing like a headset or if I have um, uh, headphones on that have chips around the top of it and I just think of it and it happens, that's okay. Mm. But I don't, I, Neuralink, mm -mm, I don't think so. Yeah, I'm, um, I'm not sure I'm sold on any of what you described either, but go ahead. <laughs> and then the whole idea of smartphones <clears throat> being replaced by um, assistants. <clears throat> you know, there's a product out now called Rabbit that does this, where essentially you just talk to it and it does what it does without apps. Um, I think uh, that could happen, but I think it will be additive to smartphones as opposed to replacing them. I think that'll be a feature on your smartphone, but you'll still be able to look at it, tap at it, talk to it, and give it commands. What else is going on in the world of consumer tech that, that you have your eye on? You, you mentioned uh, actually before uh, coming here, you sent me an email about some EV news, electric oh, vehicles. Oh, this is, this is really interesting. So... Um, there is there was a story that I read this morning. There is now a uh, electric car being sold by a company called BYD in China. It's not scheduled yet to come to the U.S. Um, that and it is a quality made car for ninety seven hundred dollars. Um, this has got automakers shaking because what it means is it can be done much cheaper than they're doing it. Um, and, uh, and so the prices of, of, uh, electric cars are already coming down. I was at a, a dealership this weekend getting my Toyota serviced and Toyota is now selling electric vehicles. They and, and Honda were both kind of lagging behind on it. They now have them. These were SUVs. The sticker price on them was like, on one was like $47,000. They had a sale price on it of $34,000. And um, I was just kind of astonished, and I talked to them, and, and it's been kind of common knowledge for a while that EVs are not selling as well as they had hoped. They can't get them off the can't get them off the lot, and the salespeople I talked to were quite honest. They said, "Yeah, you know, we're not able to sell these as much as we want to." So I think what you're starting to see is a real drop in the price of EVs. And I wouldn't be surprised if very, very soon they don't reach parity or maybe are even cheaper than gasoline vehicles. Well, and that would be a significant threshold to cross. Right. Uh, and one that it sounds like maybe some uh, traditional gas companies are preparing for. You also noted that Shell is looking to put more charging stations in and their gas stations. Yes, right? they are. <clears throat> Shell. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Shell is looking to um, take a 1,000 of its gas stations and convert them into charging stations. Now, that's a tiny fraction of the stations that Shell has. They have about, um, this is about, I believe in the story I read, uh, it's about 4% of their gas stations, so it's a tiny amount. But that is significant that a, a, uh, that a company that deals in fossil fuels is making this shift. 
Dwight Silverman writes a column on consumer technology for the Houston Chronicle. He joins us once a month to walk through consumer tech developments. Dwight, as always, thanks very much. Thanks for having me and my frog in my throat. <laughs> Still to come, the Rockets, excuse me, the, uh, the Cougars are moving on to the Sweet 16. We will talk about that and uh, also a big developing kind of scandal in Major League Baseball involving its biggest superstar. Stay with us as Houston Matters continues. It took overtime, but the University of Houston Cougars men's basketball team advanced to the Sweet 16 last night in a 195 win over Texas A&M. It was the first time since 1987 that a team advanced in the NCAA tournament after four of its players had fouled out of the game. And while that might arguably be the story of the week in Houston area sports, it's not the story in the sports world right now. That dubious title belongs to Major League Baseball superstar Shohei Otani, who's holding a news conference today to offer his explanation for whatever part, if any, he's played in a developing scandal over four and a half million dollars paid from Otani's bank account to a suspected bookie under federal investigation. Yikes. So, two big things to talk about with Houston Press writer and Believe in Astros podcast co-host Jeff Balky. Jeff, good morning. Good morning, Craig. Let's start with the Cougs win yes, for the Yankees. Let's. It seemed like Houston had this game in hand most of the way before uh, some foul trouble began. Mm. How did the Aggies claw back from, a, in particular, a 10-point deficit in the last minute, 24, to force overtime? College basketball drives me so crazy because the last two minutes of a, of a game or a half, they, they go on for like... 45 minutes. Right. It takes forever. Um, they just kept fouling and, and kept making big shot after big shot. Look, the Aggies are really good. And, and I think they're an interesting, kind of a bad matchup for the Cougars in general. First of all, they are the best or one of the best offensive rebounding teams in all of college basketball. And the Cougars are woefully lacking because they just don't have a lot of big man depth because of injuries they've had all season. Um, also, they match the Cougars' physicality. Most teams don't. The Cougars are extremely physical, exceptionally good defensively, and most teams just don't have that match, and the, and, and the Aggies do. So it's just a tough matchup, I think. To have four starters foul out and to still win the game, uh, you know, the, the kid Elvin came in who never yeah. plays – it was a, somebody tweeted that he was the Ollie, he was Ollie. It from was Hoosiers. Ollie. That's exactly, it's exactly what I thought what, of. And I was like, did he? Sh he should have shot Granny shots for his free throws. <laughs> I mean, it was just, <laughs> it just everything that happened in that game was unbelievable. They just needed the music in the background. That <laughs> no, exactly. Where's Gene Hackman yeah. when you need him? But I'm like, uh, every, people on the radio are just turning off. They're like, what are they talking about? But um, I just feel like. When it came to this game, the Cougars had to survive. This is literally a survive in advance. Yeah. I think this was a very tough matchup for them, and they came out of it with a win, but just barely. It, it doesn't really get any easier now. They take mm -hmm. on Duke Friday night at 8.30. Any initial thoughts on that draw? I feel like Duke might be a slightly better just general matchup for them. Duke's obviously playing really, really well right now. Um, but I think the Cougars, look, I am so impressed with Jamal Shedd as a player. Uh, he looks like an NBA player. He's a little on the short side, but I think he's, he reminds me a bit of Kyle Lowry in the NBA. He's got, he can get his own shot. He's got great handles. He sees the floor really well. And he's a stocky guy who can body up against other players. I think he probably won't get drafted in the first round, but I think he has a shot, an outside shot to make an NBA team after he spent a little time in the G League. He's a very impressive young player. Okay, let's talk about what's happened in the last week surrounding Shohei oh, Otani. Yeah, I'm going to summarize it as best mm -hmm. I can here. All right, starting on Tuesday, ESPN interviewed Otani's now former interpreter, Ipe Mizuhara, who in that interview reportedly claimed the Dodgers star pitcher and outfielder was paying off the interpreter's gambling debts. Mm -hmm. If true, it could put Otani in a tight spot because such activity is illegal in California and he could be in violation of Major League Baseball rules, too. Except then Wednesday, Mizuhara changed his story and said Otani knew nothing about the payments. Mizuhara was then fired, and representatives for Otani released a statement indicating the ball player had been the victim of a, quote, massive theft. 
On Friday, Major League Baseball announced its own investigation. Over the weekend, reports surfaced that Mizuhara's resume prior to working for Otani is now in question. Mm -hmm. And on Sunday, Otani, who's just begun a $700 million contract with the Dodgers, announced he would hold a news conference today to address the scandal. What do you make of all of this? Yeah, it's fascinating. I mean, it's important to note that this started with the L.A. Times, did a story about this bookie who's under investigation, uh, and they found two wire transfers from Otani, each of $500,000. Um, and then Shohei Otani's own people set up the interview for his interpreter with ESPN. So it's not like he just went to ESPN or they corralled him. Otani's people set it up. He went, gave his story, and then immediately after, Otani's lawyers are like, no, 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 that's not what happened. And so, listen, I don't know. I, we, none of us really know what happened. Hopefully we'll figure it out. But this is this is not good for Otani. It's and certainly not good for baseball. Yeah, of the possibilities here, Otani could mm -hmm. genuinely be the victim of embezzlement. Mizuhara may have been telling the truth initially, but changed his story to protect Otani. Yeah. Or Otani might have been the one doing the gambling, yeah, in no. which case Mizuhara is really taking the fall here. Does any one of those outcomes seem more logical than another, or are they all kind of potential? Right. Okay, so for me, it feels like that middle scenario, that essentially what happened is the translator got underwater. He and Otani, by the way, it's important to note that he and Otani are very good friends. This is not just a guy that was hired to be his translator. He's been with Otani for years. They take ground balls together and stuff. In the, I mean, they're they're tight. Yeah. So to me, it sounds like this guy got way underwater. First of all, a bookie would never give a four and a half million dollar line of credit to an interpreter. He might give it to some to Shohei Otani, though. And so you've got to figure that this was some kind of thing where he got underwater. The original story was is that Otani paid the bookie he didn't want to give the money to the interpreter because he's afraid he'd gamble it right so that seems very logical and if it is it can just be like hey we didn't realize that it was illegal you know i mean we didn't know that this was going to be a serious problem but this has been going back years too by the way it's not like this happened last week this has been going on for a number of years when he was with the angels it's it's a mess and baseball's got to do something about it because they draw those hard lines uh, when it comes to betting, even though they're, of course, in bed with FanDuel and everybody else. The rule posted in every Major League clubhouse since the 1919 scandal, members of the Chicago White Sox throwing the World Series mm -hmm. back then, is don't bet on baseball. There, to date, doesn't seem to be any indication right. that there was any betting on baseball. Doesn't seem that way. But may have been on, on other sports, nevertheless. Uh, this is just the latest example yes. of how pervasive gambling is within the culture of pro sports today. Uh, as you, you mentioned, I mean, it's all over the broadcasts. Right. It's marketed heavily. Yeah. It's a huge revenue generator for pro sports. There are pro football and pro hockey teams now in Las Vegas. Yeah. That was a line that hadn't been crossed till about yes. a decade ago. And about to be a baseball team, too. Yeah. So what caused this change? Was it... Uh, Craig, I'll give you one guess. And yeah. if the answer is money, you win. <laughs> yeah. That is, it is all about money. The, the, look, gambling is a, like a trillion dollar industry. Um, th and people who are interested in sports, not all sports fans, but a lot of sports fans, you know, the competition on the field extends to off the field and people are competitive. There have been Super Bowl bracket pools for years. There have been NCAA bracket tournament challenges for, for decades. I mean, these things have been going on informally and otherwise for a long time. Look, Jimmy the Greek used to come on NFL yeah. and talk about the betting lines. So this has been something that has been involved. But for a long, long time, it was something that only kind of degenerates did. Now, with fantasy league sports and in-game betting it has become mainstream and analytics yes there are a lot of folks that have so bought into analytics yes. they believe that there is a way for them to make money yes. betting on games based off of what the analytics tell them yeah and and i think everybody thinks they can be a gm now and so now that everybody has all this data available to them they and and it's a way for them to get involved and some broadcasts are yeah. really outrageous in the degree to which they share odds and lines yep. and spreads in real time. I, I was watching one hockey game the other day where in the corner of the screen, they're telling you in real time the percentage chance that somebody's going to win a faceoff. 
Mm-hmm. It doesn't make any sense. Well, it's it's a crazy thing that's been happening in sports. It's not going away. Uh, it is something that we all are going to have to reckon with. And when you look at the way sports has turned in that way, it's almost as if the people in major league sports and college sports and everywhere else realize that fans want to be more and more and more invested in the game. And this is a way to get them invested. And when they are invested, they spend money. And when they spend money, everybody gets wealthy except for the people who lose money gambling. And I think this is just the way it is in sports going forward. I don't think we have a choice anymore as to what it is. And I think more scandals like this are going to emerge as a result. To me, all of those graphics and all of the, Mm -hmm the references to odds and lines and all of this stuff, it makes it harder for me to invest in the game. Right. Well, look at Bernie Bickerstaff, who came out the other day, the Cleveland Cavaliers coach, and said that play, people yell at him from the stands to keep his players in so they can ma- so they can do the line, Beat make sure the that they're having to make, hit the spread. It's ridiculous. It's insane. But it's, you know, it's here to stay. Jeff Balky writes for the Houston Press, co-hosts the Believe in Astros podcast, and joins us most Mondays to discuss developments in sports. Jeff, thank you very much. Thank you, Craig. And that will do it for today's show. The Houston Matters team includes Michael Haggerty, Joshua Zinn, Troy Schultz, Celeste Sherman, Garrett Bowman, and Brenda Valdivia. Jared Carroll is our technical director. On tomorrow's show, a total solar eclipse will be visible in Texas on April 8th. Houston's view will be a partial block by the moon of the light from the sun. We'll discuss where and how to get a good view with Nicole Temple, Vice President of Education for the Houston Museum of Natural Science. I'm Craig Cohen. Join us tomorrow for that and other Houston Matters.